I forget who's teaching today, but okay, Julie's here. And a quick shout out to Nancy Prince in the UK. Good morning. Thanks for saying hello. All right, let's dig in. I had some uh, pause and ponders this week, and some of them got deep. And in light of today's message and where we're hoping to end off with, if you hate a person, then you, you're defeated by them. And I thought, that's, uh, we don't talk like that very often, but man, if you think this through, this, that's a pretty heavy duty one. It's been fun finding God in the places the church told me not to look. <laughs> this one's really true. <laughs> You know, you're told, don't go see that movie, don't read that book, don't, don't, don't. All these things that some preachers say on Sunday mornings to their congregation trying to tell them what to do. Um, Go do those things because half the time they're really, really good. Um, Or the book is really good or the movie's really good. Music, finding God in music and songs that you wouldn't believe. Um, Especially the love of God in beautiful places. And from people who aren't even Christians. I know, shock, shock, but uh, anyway, I just thought that was really cool. Steve Matheson writes, Some people mistakenly believe that trusting in God requires them to distrust science, history, art, philosophy, and other forms of education, information, and truth. But intelligence is a friend of faith, and ignorance its enemy. God loves knowledge and truth, and any faith that objects to either is terribly misguided. Ooh, that one's good. Hopefully that'll make you pause and ponder that one. The incarnation means that we are deeply, inextricably connected to one another. For Christ is deeply and inextricably united with all humankind. We just celebrated Easter last week. And the whole idea of union, that we are one not only with Christ but with each other. I thought that was good timing for this one. Last one. Robert Capon. In Jesus' death and resurrection, God has declared that he isn't the least interested in examining anybody's books ever again, not even his own. He's nailed them all to the cross. Accountability, however, much it may be a buzzword now, is not one of his eschatological categories. (laughs) The books are closed. Sin has been dealt with. And it's a lesson for us to, if God's done that to us, then we need to learn to do that for others too. But I think it has to be fully believed and realized in us in order for that to be possible in forgiving and letting go of others. It's, 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 it's a pretty, this, this book is huge. It's a thick book too, but it's a very deep, deep, deep book. All right, devotional meditation. Henry Nouwen. Love is the theme today, by the way, just in case you haven't caught that yet. Come home to where love dwells. The first love says, you are loved long before other people can love you or you can love others. You are accepted long before you can accept others or receive their acceptance. You are safe long before you can offer or receive safety. Home is the place where that first love dwells and speaks gently to us. It requires discipline to come home and listen, especially when our fears are so noisy that they keep driving us outside of ourselves. But when we grasp the truth that we already have a home, we may at last have the strength to unmask the illusions created by our fears and continue to return again and again and again. And we're going to end the message with another reflection from Henry Nouwen that uh, uh, was sent to me this morning. But the road beyond Easter. So what was the point? What was the message? This next video clip um, we saw last week at the end, but we're going to start today with this one again. This tree is over 300 feet tall, estimated to be at least 600 years old. And that's nothing. There are trees towering over this forest that were just seedlings when Christ was walking on the earth. 
How deep do you think the roots are on a tree like this? 100 feet, 1,000 feet? The truth is a tree this tall can't grow roots deep enough to support itself. That is why redwoods have intertwining roots. They support one another. These trees literally do for each other what they can't do alone. I think Jesus demonstrated that same mindset for us, that we're all in this together, supporting one another. I mean, think about it. He never just passed somebody by leaving them stuck. Jesus was constantly intertwining his life with those he came in contact with. He called people out of obscurity to join him in this journey of changing the world. He healed a blind man with mud. He restored a chronically ill outcast with merely the hem of his garment. He renewed one woman's hope for second chances and, and reminded a Pharisee of his need for mercy instead of morality. Jesus' ministry was constantly intertwined with people, connecting with them on the most intimate levels and changing their lives forever. Jesus called his followers to love people the way that he loved them, to bring health to the sick, raise the dead, cast out demons, touch the untouchables, and as you have been treated generously, so live generously. And that call hasn't expired. Yeah, his charge to the church is just as clear today as ever. Therefore, may we be rooted in Christ, intertwined with one another, so that we may continue his mission. So his, his mission, this can get confusing because, uh, uh, well, remember the what would Jesus do bracelets? Bumper stickers, you know? it makes you have to come up with an idea of what would Jesus do. It's all dependent on you getting the right answer. That's not what Jesus came to do. He modeled how to live. He modeled abiding in his Father. We're called to abide in Christ, not follow a list of rules. Any of the rules that we're to follow are already embedded in our hearts. They're not a rule per se. They're they're an actual affection of God living out of us. How, how can we live for others? How do we stay rooted in Christ? How does this live out? It's not the to-do list that we've been given. Here is the list of ten things to do to be a good Christian. It's baloney. It's the get-to list, not the have-to. And each person has their own, based on your personality, your connections with people. We are intertwined. Ephesians three sixteen to 20 says, I pray that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant that you may be strengthened in your inner being with power through his, Holy, through his Spirit, and that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith as you are being rooted and grounded in love. I pray that you may have the power to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth and to know the love of Christ that surpasses knowledge so that you may be filled with all the fullness of God. Now to him who, by the power at work within us, is able to accomplish abundantly far more than we can ask or imagine. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus to all generations forever and ever. Amen. We're called to be rooted. We're called to live from the faith that has been placed in us. 
not to come up with your own faith, not to have a banner that said, my faith stronger than yours, well, that person's is stronger than mine. That's not what faith is about. Faith is the gift that's been given to us. I like this about Easter. Uh, this is from John Crowder, one of his books. He took your cross. At the end of the day, you really do not even get to carry your own cross. This is much, this this is such an idol in the church. Religious people love to boast about the cross they're carrying. When Jesus talks about denying yourself and taking up your cross, this is really a passage about ceasing from your own self-efforts and self-driven attempts at spiritual advancement. Let self be smudged totally out of the equation. In the eternal sense, this verse means that we are to follow after Christ's sacrifice, not mimic it, but trust in in it alone for our salvation and sustainment, writes our friend Ben Dunn, the happy gospel. The sense here in this scripture is not self-sacrifice in the way that most would see it. It actually is a call to deny any heavenly advancement through self-achievement. Ooh. Now, Self-sacrifice. Where would the word sacrifice be known in the Jewish world? The whole religious system. So that's like ingrained. It's second nature. I remember when I was starting to understand the deeper and wider love of God, I thought, man, what, what wall is in front of me preventing me from getting this gospel, getting this good news? And turns out I, there was no wall in front of me. I was in the wall. I was in the Western wall of thinking and ideology. Uh, it, was, it was a misconcept. And here's the word sacrifice is a misconcept of what the message is. And I thought he did a great job of saying it's not about mimicking. We, we, in that one video clip, he talked about Jesus healing this person, doing all that. There's hardly any duplications in his story, except if you read four Gospels and you see some parallels. But they're different different authors sharing the same lens, from different lenses. Jesus did not say, go around and you do these things, like uh, you just saw me heal the person with mud? Start slapping blind people with mud in their face and spit in their eyes. That would go over really well. Jesus instead saw the person in front of him at that given moment, had a deep compassion for them, and acted according to what the Father told him to do at that moment. He didn't have a plan. He didn't start the morning. All right, good morning, Lord. It's uh, 5 a.m., and uh, let's get our to-do list in order and make sure that we're on the same page. So we're going to wake up. We're going to make some breakfast for the guys down by the lake, surprise them. Then I'm going to go over to one of the boats and have them catch a lot of fish. That's a great. Would that please you? I think that would be great, right? Good idea. And then maybe I'll crash a funeral at 11 raise somebody, and then maybe I'll head down to, to the pool and maybe heal a person down there. Does this sound like an okay? Would you be pleased if I did all these things? Jesus didn't do that. It's as he was going. Remember last week we ended with make disciples of all nations? And we're reminded that Jesus did not say go and make converts. He didn't say, switch people from their religions to yours. He said, make disciples. And the word go doesn't mean, you're sitting there right now, now go. That's not what it means, although that's how we can read it, and that's how it's been taken. The word go literally means, as you are going, as you are living your day out, as. And making disciples is often modeled, sometimes taught, Sometimes it requires studying and learning. It's not the typical evangelism thread that we've been told. I don't think so. That's, that's how I see it now. I thought that was really good. Healthy roots, when we love one another unconditionally, this is how we can be intertwined together, following after the footsteps of Christ, because he loved. Love isn't a state of perfect caring. It's an active noun-like struggle. To love someone is to strive to accept that person exactly the way he or she is right here and now. That one's hard. 
really hard. Let's move on quick. John 13, 34 to 35. A new command I give you. Love one another as I have loved you. So you must love one another as I loved you. So you must love one another. How did Jesus love? Unconditionally. By this, everyone will know you're my disciples if you have the correct doctrines. Oh no, if you love one another. Hmm. Did you also know there's a difference between a command and a law? <laughs> if you've grown up in the church for any period of time, lots of laws, lots of rules. You must, you must, you must. And there aren't enough in the Bible, so they make up even more for, in order for you to be a, a good member. I've, I've seen some horrible lists, even telling people what to wear, what not to wear. Even telling people where to go and not go. Like, black and white lists. It's insane what we've done. But that's not what's here. The command, the command is different than the rule. The law, which we've grown up with in the church, we see it all through Scripture. There's the law of God that was told to the, to the Jewish people, obey these laws. If you don't, these are the repercussions. But a command is an instruction for your benefit. Where if you break a law, there's a consequence. The command is, here, do this. This is the way you're designed. This is the way you've been created. This is the, this is the, the operator's manual, or if you, I was just, we had a piece of our fridge break, and so I looked up the manual. I want to get the right part from the actual company, right? Jesus is saying, this is, this is how I wired you to love one another. Don't let those outside voices speak negativity to you. Hear my voice within you. You are loved. You are accepted. You are valued unconditionally. Yeah, but what about this part in my life? No, I love you. And when you start to believe that, those things you're doing to harm yourself, they will begin to get healed and be dealt with. Instead of the opposite way we've been told, we've told people, go stop doing these things so you can get better. And there's some value to that. But honestly, the work happens from within, from spirit. Spirit to soul, to mind, to body. In 1 John 4, 9 to 11, it says, this is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son into the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we loved, but that he loved us and sent his son as an atoning sacrifice for our sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. It's a lot of love one another's. Hmm. I'm not sure I like this always. Right? There are people that are hard to love. Healthy roots. When we love one another sacrificially. Ooh, now it's getting worse. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus. Who, being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be used to his own advantage. Oh, I've always wondered that. So of course Jesus can do all that stuff. Of course he lived the perfect life. He's God. He uses God card. Sin, no sin, it's me, I'm God. Yeah, I always thought, okay, he has this extra out, this extra power that we haven't got. That's how he did it. But Jesus lived just like you and I. He did not live out of his humanity. He lived out of his, div uh, sorry, he, did, he lived out of his humanity, not his divinity. He chose not to take advantage of the God card and experience the same things as us, hunger, depression, sadness. He, he felt all those things. He felt the emotions of grief. He felt anger. He felt all of our emotions, all of our emotions. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. Jesus lived the sacrificial life, living for others, not self-centered. When we take a look at what love is, love is patient, love is kind, that word agape means something. It is an other-centered sacrificial love. 1 John 3, 16 says, we know love by this, that he laid down his life for us, and we ought to lay down our lives for one another. 
How does God's love abide in anyone who has, has the world's goods and sees a brother or sister in need and yet refuses to help? How? Little children, let us love, not in word or speech, but in truth and action. And by this, we will know that we are from the truth and will reassure our hearts before him. Whenever our hearts condemn us, for God is greater than our hearts, and he knows everything. We, th- this is how to live this out. How does this look practically? And only each one of you can, you'll know the answer in your own hearts. But when we love one another, it's the forgiving part comes into this. We've done a whole series on forgiveness a couple times. Might even do it again next year. I don't know. But this ties into how Jesus lived. He said, love one another, but he also talked about forgiveness. Grace and forgiveness is a gift that we are forever trying to turn into a deal. Grace and forgiveness. It all comes from a misunderstanding of what forgiveness is. Ephesians 4.32. Be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other just as in Christ God forgave you. This is one of the most blunt calls, commands to us to forgive one another. It might mean we have some things to unlearn about what we think forgiveness is. And we might have to learn what forgiveness is. And I'll tell you from personal experience, I'm still learning. There are still layers and depths to how forgiveness plays out, especially when it comes to interpersonal relationships. It's big. It, it, it's clear in my mind. I, uh, we're forgiven. That's how, he says, uh, just, as, just as God forgave us. When we know we're forgiven, boy, oh boy, it starts to make a little more sense that, okay, we are forgivers by nature. Your default is to forgive. So when you don't, you're not acting according to who you truly are. But then you have the yeah, but, what about questions. And that's a good list. We're not going to deal with that one today. Uh, if, you've, if you've seen the forgiveness series, you can go through that one. And, and there's a whole bunch of great misconceptions to wrestle through. But I will say this. One of the biggest misconceptions of what forgiveness is, it's assuming that that person gets to come back in your life immediately. And if you haven't allowed that, then you're not allowed, then you haven't forgiven them. That's a misconception. That is not true. We can forgive someone and never allow them back into our lives, especially when things are dangerous or have been deeply hurt. But we can forgive, and when we do, which is an action between you and your Heavenly Father, when that forgiveness is offered, even if it's done with gritting teeth and, okay, fine, I forgive you, and you even, may not even mean it, but your spirit is telling you, say it, and you keep saying it, finally, after time, it may become real to you because the Holy Spirit wants you to, and only then can you begin to heal. It's a big, big, big topic. Colossians 3.13. Bear with each other and forgive one another if any of you has a grievance against someone. Forgive as the Lord forgave you. There it is again. I like the, uh, I didn't have the slide up here for that one, but there's a verse that talks about make allowances for each other's errors and immaturity. Make allowance for that. Wake up with the, intention, somebody is going to really mess up. Somebody is not going to drive the way I want them to. Somebody is going to do these dumb habits that drive me nuts every time I show up for work or at home or whatever. But we wake up with the intention, I'm going to forgive. I am a forgiving person. My nature, my spirit is one that forgives. It's not for the other person. It's for you. That's really important. Forgiveness is for you. Healthy roots grow when we love forgivingly. It's all rooted in love. God is love, not hate. Half of good theology is just remembering this. (laughs) Think about that. Love wins. Tina Turner was wrong. What's love got to do with it? It's got everything to do with it. It's the foundation of our lives. 
the foundation of our relationships. It's the foundation of our understanding of who we think God is. It's the foundation of understanding who we are, how God sees us, and fixing our mindsets to believe that. 1 Corinthians 13, if I speak in the tongues of men or of angels but do not have love, I am only a resounding gong or a clanging cymbal. We've read that whole text before. It's a big one. Agape is the word love there. It means other-centered. There are seven different Greek words for the word love. Four I remember. The storge is a parental love. I love my kid. It's, it, it, that's, that's the word they have. Um, eros, you get the word erotic. Uh, phileo, like fish. That's the friendship love. And then agape. That's the word here. Agape. Other-centered. Never self-seeking. Not keeping records of wrongs. That one's hard, too. I love this from Richard Murray. I admit I loved many people poorly, but I can't ever unlove a person once I do. I simply can't utter the words, I don't love you anymore. Love has no reverse gear, refund option, or return policy. Certainly, love allows for maintaining healthy boundaries, goodwill treaties, and even painful partings, but never for eternal loathing. I admit, this dynamic can sometimes leave our hearts scarred, jarred, and bruised, but Jesus' scars and bruises were cosmic beauty marks. Love always beautifies, ultimately. Richard Murray. Hmm. That's a hard one when you've been hurt. Abused, rejected, abandoned. It's not easy. You can say you don't love them the same way, <laughs> but I like the you can't ever unlove. Although, emotionally, some people reach a place of hate even. It's part of the journey, but you don't stay there. That just shows the inner healing that's needed. Claim God's love for you. Dan Hergett sent that to me this morning. For a very long time, I've considered how, oh, sorry, for a very long time, I considered lowest self-esteem to be some kind of virtue. I've been warned so often against pride and conceit that I came to consider it a good thing to depreciate myself. But now I realize that the real sin is to deny God's first love for me, to ignore my original goodness. Because without claiming that first love and that original goodness for myself, I lose touch with my true self and embark on the destructive search among the wrong people and in the wrong places for what can only be found in the house of my Father. Where do you find your identity? Where do you find your worth, self-worth? It's amazing how many struggle with self-worth. And even in some circles they say, well, that's too much self-centered language. Well, you got to deal with the ego one way or another. But if we can find that our true identity is spirit, it isn't our body, it isn't our jobs, it isn't our reputations, but our identity is our union with Christ. It is what Jesus did. It is what we celebrate at Easter. Our identity is our co-crucifixion with Jesus. He died, you died. He rose, you rose. I rose, we rose. The roots are there. They're put together. It all happened at the cross. We're all in. There's no one excluded. There isn't us versus them, which we love to do in religion. There's only us. There's the Trinity. I keep remembering the watch story. When I, somebody gave me a watch at a conference way back. Rod was at that conference, Rod Sider. 
that's when I first met Rod. This is before I knew any of, anything about Hope Fellowship. And uh, I'm teaching at a conference, and I didn't have a watch on. They kept asking what time it was. And finally, a guy comes up to me at the end and said, Hey, I feel the Lord's telling me to give you my watch. And he almost had a grimace on his face. I went, hmm, okay. Put it on. Oh, it was nice, light, cool. Didn't have to ask the time or anyone. It was like, really nice, fit nice, great. Went home, told Lori, hey, God gave me a watch, oh, that's nice. And then uh, throughout the year, I was working away in projects around the house and gardening. And that year I built a shed on back of my garage. And so I'm hammering and slugging away. And clearly you can tell I built it when we're done. But anyway, it worked. And uh, battery died. Okay. You know, you go to the mall and you kind of go to that cheap place here, put the battery in. They, they said, nope, you got to take it to a jeweler. I thought to myself, well, are you dumb? You don't know how to do this? You know, we don't think like that with the outside voice always. Some do, but shouldn't. Um, but I thought that. And so off I went, off I went to downtown Elmira to the jeweler shop and I told them that the, the other place couldn't replace it, and he's looking at it, and um, then I tell him some guy gave this watch to me at a conference. And his eyes kind of went, I could tell. He was, okay, gave. And I thought, oh, is it, why, is it a nice watch? Said, yeah, it's a really nice watch. And so he said, look, it says it's on the back, Sapphire Crystal, 14K. I think, oh, and it says Movado. Ooh, doesn't mean anything to me. <laughs> so I said, so what, is it worth much? He says, well, when it was new, it was anywhere between $2,500 and $3,000. I've been wearing a freaking expensive watch the whole time. And then he says, want me to clean it up and replace the band too? And I'm still in shock. Yeah, <laughs> please. <laughs> so he cleaned it up, and I came home and told Lori. You can imagine what she said. Let's go find out how much it's worth on eBay. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it is true. <laughs> it's very funny. But uh, um, here's something that happened, though. I never wore that watch in a dirty place or doing construction, gardening, sports. I only wore that watch ever again when I was doing an event or something, something where I wanted to make sure it wouldn't get wrecked. And the reason I did is because I knew its value. I didn't, I, I didn't know. The guy who gave it to me did. By the way, he was a watch store or an owner <laughs> in Aurelia. He's the one who gave it to me. And I've connected with him many, many times. But because I knew its value, I took care of it. And when you begin to know your value, you'll start to take care of yourself too. But the voices of you're not valuable, you're not good enough, are so freaking loud in this world. And sometimes our filter is so clogged full we can't hear when goodness comes to us. You're all a special watch. You're all a special diamond. You're all valuable in Christ. If that's not what you're seeing in the mirror, ask Jesus to give you a prescription change to change your lens. Ask Jesus to show you how he sees you. And the more you hear it, the more you're going to begin to believe it. That is your true identity, and that's what we live out of. That's how we're rooted, because when you start to see your identity that way, you're going to start to see other people's identity the same way. <gasps> I think it's in Second Peter 1. It has this list of all these things that we're supposed to do that, you know, godliness will lead to, faithfulness will lead to, whatever, all kinds of stuff. And then finally it says, pretty soon you have, you'll have love for fellow believers or your brotherhood or fellow Christians. Okay, that's really nice. And then it gets to the line, and then you'll have love for everyone. But it begins with you. And your renewing of your mind, your metanoia, that means repent. Repent doesn't mean, I screwed up, I'm so sorry, please forgive me. It's not what repentance is. 
Repentance is changing your mind about what you believe about God and what you believe about yourself and how God sees you. That's repentance. Repentance is beautiful, and we do it all the time. I repent an awful lot as I grow deeper in all this. There's still more to come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, will you be our repentance for us? Especially if we're stuck. Especially if our minds can't get there. Will you bring us to that place and give us a revelation, a waking up, an awakening of your love towards us? So that you begin to change us from the inside out. Help us see we are rooted with each other. We are connected and united. Teach us how to really love one another. Just as you loved us. I pray this in Jesus' name.